welcome to another episode of Travel Stories with Marsh, the first travel podcast in the Middle East. So if you love the world around you and you love exploring different landscapes, cultures, cuisines and cities, then this is the right place for you because here every week I'll be talking to an incredible travel enthusiast who will take us on a fascinating journey around the world by sharing their travel stories. Today's very interesting traveler is someone who believes that traveling is gaining life experiences. Jean Winter is a philanthropist and an angel investor, amongst many other things. She has also lived across continents and is the founder of the UAE's only FNB agency that represents top chefs in the region and around the world. Jean, welcome to the podcast. And I have to tell you that I have really waited to have you on this episode today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, you know, um, you are like, there's so many things that you do. There's so much, so many facets to your personality, which we will be exploring mm -hmm. one by one. But um, something, you know, that I find really, truly inspiring is the fact that uh, you started the first all-inclusive, like the Disability Inclusive Management Agency and Consultancy in the UAE. Mm -hmm. And um, you also started the community outreach programs, you know, with that. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, it has been two years. Uh, we started, so we represent people. Mm -hmm. Um, people with stories to share, celebrity chefs, celebrity athletes, um, Paralympians, Special Olympians. Yeah. Uh, we also represent a lot of POD kids mm -hmm. that whose stories have never been heard. Right. Right. Yeah. So my focus is actually um, local and global community outreach mm -hmm. more than anything else. So Touch is now serving as a platform. Mm for people with stories that we need to hear. Mm. And at the same time, it enables me to carry out local outreach mm. and global outreach without calling it a charity. Um, with the money that comes in, what we do is we choose projects mm -hmm. to support in. Of course, you know, this is a travel podcast and we'll be talking about travel, but you know, everything that you say, the ethos of what you do is just so inspiring and so fascinating. And you've been really experiencing a lot about um, life and your core values have started, you know, from, from very early stages, mm. you know, you come from very humble backgrounds mm. and you still say that your parents live a very simple life. Mm. And, you know, you, uh, but like I said, in the very beginning, you know, when I introduced you that you, you think that traveling is really, you know, it's, it's like gaining life experiences mm. for you and who better than you to say that when you have actually traveled 30 countries by the time you were 23 mm -hmm. and uh, you used like scholarship money at the time to travel to countries. <laughs> My you dad know? was not impressed, but yes, I did. Yeah, but you still picked up those very rich experiences at, at the time, mm. you know, when you were so young. So what, you know, inspired you to do that? What told you to do that? I mean, how did you think that you want to travel and gain these experiences? The fact that I was 18 and I was able to travel without my parents. Yeah. And it was the freedom. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It was not just the freedom, but yeah. because at that time I was obsessed with the travel channel. Ah. That was my go-to. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I, I always loved traveling. I've always loved people. Mm. And I think that was from a young age, mm. the moment I was able to, especially when I had the money from the scholarship. Yeah which otherwise I wouldn't have, have access to at yeah. 18. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, that's a lot of money at that time. Yeah. I remembered we had $5,000 mm -hmm. every six months. And this was in university in Singapore? Yeah, yeah. in US. And I remembered telling my mom, I'm going to travel. I'm going to book myself into this and that. My mom was like, go. Because my mom was that's Singapore's how is uh, that? one of the earliest female um, travel agents. Mm. And in fact, I think she was the first female agent to um, be invited on the first plane out of Singapore. Wow. So now today, you know, when we come back to the podcast, yes. I'm very intrigued to know where yeah. are you taking us on a journey? For me, excitement mm -hmm. is not the likes of Paris. Sure. For me, excitement is exploring places mm -hmm. unknown. So probably the 
hill tribes mm -hmm. as a child um, where my mom would bring me up to to do outreach. So at that time... And where was this? This was in Ching Rai. So it's above Ching Mai, further up from Ching Mai. It was the hill tribes. And that was probably my earliest memory of being uncomfortable. Mm. Chiang Mai, so in Thailand, is yes. it? Yes. Okay. So Chiang Rai is further up in the mountain tribes. Okay. And okay. This was 30 over years ago. Mm -hmm. And we would have to live in straw. It's not even a hut. A hut has a, 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 as a, a, roof. Hut has a roof. Yeah. So but this, we don't have oh, a roof. Oh, you didn't have a roof. And then you have, when you wake up in the morning, as I still remember it, it was just uh, mud, a mud bed. So it's like a hardened mud bed mm -hmm. where they just put straw on top and then you sleep on oh, top. Oh, okay. Okay. And then when you wake up, you see all the kids looking through <laughs> through the um, tetch yeah. straws or straws. Yeah, yeah. And just watching you get dressed and... It's like hay. You're sleeping on hay, literally, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's basically a, a tetched... Surrounding, surrounding. Surrounding. Yeah. Where they just basically create a... Mm -hmm tent without yeah. the roof yeah and then you have like all these people just because they are not used to people yeah. all those years ago just yeah. looking in and they'll be so curious and um i remember and this is all chiang rai yeah yeah and bathing in the river just mm. with a sarong just nature all just around nature. you yeah um at that time i didn't appreciate it and i was like oh why are we here? Mm. You know, and I, I was in charge of playing the organ, mm. teaching them English to music. Mm. So that was one of the earliest enjoy me enjoying a trip after the trip. Mm. During the trip, I was like, why are we not in a hotel? And I think that was also my mom's way yeah. of teaching me that travel is not just about Places and hotels and yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, sure. Your mom is amazing, she, I have to yeah. say, yeah. yeah. I and mean, you know, we try as mothers to kind of, you know, protect our children or, you know, you don't think out of the box a lot of the times, mm. you know, we, and especially when you're in Dubai and you live the life that you live, mm. it's all about protecting and that that is what, what is sometimes a little scary because you want your child to go out there and every place is not Dubai, you know, mm. you want them to have those experiences. Yeah. So what your mom did, I'm sure prepared the ground for you. A hundred percent. You know, by traveling. Yeah. You know, to and the way you traveled. So this Chiang Rai journey is really something. Yeah. So every year I'll try to do one trip alone. But when I say alone, it can be for my mission trip now. Sure. Yeah. So where it is still a group, mm -hmm. but as in alone without friends and family yeah. for work. Yeah. And it's to remote parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I travel with friends, girlfriends. I travel with family and I travel with my husband. Mm -hmm. So I break it, I break my travels up um, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And because we've been traveling since a very young age, mm. so which is that one place that made you kind of realize that you like travel, that there's something that, you know, even before you could kind of go out when you were, say, 18? Australia. And how old were you then? So we, we have actually visited uh, Australia multiple times mm -hmm. because of friends um, and because I, I dive. So um, I would go diving around the world as mm -hmm. well. And then I realized I really do enjoy diving in different parts of the world because mm -hmm. I see different sea life. And one of my tr earliest travel buddies was my brother and my godbrother. And we would travel together, stay in hostels. And it would be a very different experience because, you know, traveling with boys and me being the only girl. Mm. So it was pretty much um, during that time. Yeah. It was Australia because we, we stayed in the Backpackers Lodge. We met so many people. Um, we heard their stories and I wanted to experience those things for myself. And that is another thing about travel. I think these meeting people and, you know, and then their experiences, that's also a learning curve. And that's also so much exploration in its own, just by a conversation, 100%. you know. So with all these travels that you did around, which is your favorite destination so far and why? I have a few. Mm -hmm. Nepal mm -hmm. has always remained special. 
because there I learned that I was resilient or more resilient than I thought I was. Mm-hmm. I learned that I was able to um, survive not showering for probably 10 days. And for someone who is quite OCD about cleanliness, mm-hmm. that's a big thing. Okay. Um, the people were down to earth, genuine. Fiji, because I was there with um, <laughs> uh, ex-boyfriend. Mm-hmm. We had the best time because we made friends with a lot of friends. That was also where I've seen the biggest spiders and multiple... In Fiji. In Fiji, waking up to probably eight to ten spiders on the mosquito nets. Oh my God. So, but somehow that remains as one of my highlights. Mm-hmm. The ones that I would recommend everyone to go at least once or twice. Mm-hmm. Iceland. Mm-hmm. Because it's just beautiful, mm-hmm. untainted. Mm-hmm. The people understand what's true inclusion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Sumba, Indonesia, the people are special. Mm-hmm. Seychelles has always held a very special place. Again, there's so much beauty around. There's so much beauty around. And because of the hotel that we go to, it gives us the a very specific hike mm. that takes six, six hours. So it's a tough hike. And because of that, we again land in a place that is completely secluded mm-hmm. and all you see is nature. So I do like places that are unexplored, mm, unknown mm. and underappreciated. Those would be my go-tos. But I think a surprising one would be India. Really? Because my first trip ever to India is a place which all my Indian friends go, that's your first city Mm -hmm. you're going to, Bihar. No way. Oh my God. So they went, why? I said, because that's what we do. So, And this is what, in Patna, which is the capital of Bihar? Yeah. People that we met were amazing. Yeah. So, you know, the Biharis, uh, we went to see this family. Mm -hmm. They had nothing. And they were the ones, they were the paupers. And we said that they invited us to have a drink, but they had nothing. Mm. And I remembered that they went to look for chairs for us, even though I said, I'm quite happy sitting on the floor. And they went to look and borrow chairs from neighbours. For neighbour, yeah. And then they went to borrow a sari. It was dusty, but they were dusting it down. Mm. And then they, they, they covered the chairs with that sari for us to sit down. For me, that really touched me. Yeah, and sure. they were all so nice. So the people, that really left an imprint on me. Mm. And Jean, I these are it. so incredible uh, stories, you know, such incredible stories. And you were just saying that, you know, all, all experiences don't have to be these five star mm. or anything. But there must have been something... Uh, you know, in so many years of traveling around the world, which has, you know, left an uh, impression that you don't want to go back or has kind of not given you, you know, um, or are not kind of fond memories. The experience in Portugal. Mm -hmm. So what happened? I was Mm 20-some and I was traveling with, well, alone. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Again. Uh, (laughs) I was on the train and then I made friends with this girl on the train. Because she was carrying a backpack, I was carrying a backpack. And I was like, where this are you going? Within Portugal yes, that you were traveling. Portugal. Okay. There was this guy that was following us on the train. But I wasn't sure whether he was following us. Oh. So what we did was to get off. We agreed to get off together at a station. And then he followed us. And then I remembered we walked out into the square and he was still there. And when we crossed the road, he was still there. So what happened was... Like someone's talking you. We don't know. Oh, you don't know. Okay. It was so, just scary. But he was following us from train to station to us going into the streets. Mm. That's when we realized he was following us. So what we did, and by the way, I didn't know this girl. I just knew her from the train. Um, 
we went to a casino where we saw two uh, bouncers out there. I couldn't speak Portuguese, but then I basically said, help, <laughs> uh, someone is following us. And when we pointed, he was still there hiding behind a pillar. Mm -hmm. So that, at that time... It was kind of scary. It was scary. Yeah. And the bouncers basically took us in a Ferrari that one of the, I think, clients had dropped off. Oh. And drove us to a backpackers, which so, was somewhere around. So okay. we hopped into a Ferrari, which we shouldn't have. Okay. With two bouncers yeah. in a foreign country. People you don't know. Yeah. Completely. So yeah. it was between Mr. Stalker guy mm -hmm. or going in a Ferrari with two with bouncers. Two bouncers. But what happened in the end was us forging a friendship with the girl that was working in the backpackers. Mm -hmm. um, she fed us. And so it all turned out well at the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though it was, but that's something kind of, the, you, you remember that as remember something that. not so pleasant yeah. at the time. All right, now coming to some, we have all these experiences, which, you know, were not pleasant at the time, but when you look back, it was an experience for yeah. you, you know. But now something exciting. We want to know what is your hidden gem? Come. It'll be Sumba for now. Oh, yeah. So is it a village or? No, it's an island. It's, it's, it's an island, it's, okay. It's a very remote island. It's one hour on a small plane from Bali. So oh. you have to go to Bali to fly to Sumba. So you can't sail there? You no. have to, okay. I mean, unless you have your private yacht private and then you Otherwise have a lot you take of time. a small plane mm. to go there. So what's so special about Sumba? It's untouched. Mm -hmm. um, it is probably one of the few islands left with um, that still believes, uh, that has uh, monolithic, tombs outside mm. their homes mm -hmm. um, they still bury their the dead mm -hmm. literally outside a to a open tomb so they remove the huge stone slab and put the dead mm -hmm. in on top of the rest of the dead oh so they're all basically piled up wow over centuries and they still continue that tradition yes. wow so this is probably one of my favorite places so far that I call a hidden gem because everywhere else people have been, everywhere else is becoming very commercialized. Right. Um, and for me, hidden gem is somewhere unknown. Unfortunately, the fear mm. is that because already the, uh, the the hotels are starting to build in mm. Sumba. And the danger of such places is that the beauty is very quickly lost Yeah, um, through commercialization and through the hospitality world, not mm. respecting the need to preserve right. um, history, traditions, culture. Mm -hmm. And that's sad. Yeah. yeah. So for me now, it'll be Sumba because it's so untouched. Okay, now that's, I'm, I'm very excited about Sumba, actually. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you yeah. about it after this. Yes. But, you know, something that I've been looking forward mm -hmm. uh, to is going on a culinary journey mm -hmm. with you because mm -hmm. I have to say here that you are also a very acclaimed chef mm. and um, you were actually one of the first people to have the underground dining situation in Geneva, yes. uh, you know, a um, couple of years back. So not a couple, not of, couple of years decade, back. Probably. Yeah, yeah, but you did it. Yes. You did that and you're quite an acclaimed chef. So with your journeys, um, if you had if you could travel around the world mm. in one day, where do you think you would have breakfast, lunch and dinner? Breakfast, definitely in Asia. Mm -hmm. So I like the fact that I can have a Malay nasi lemak, Indian prata, Chinese noodles. They're all yeah. completely yeah. different within one sitting in a hawker center in Asia. So where would, Singapore. if you had to choose Singapore? I would pick breakfast. Singapore okay. Okay, for breakfast. Lunch and dinner would be quite exciting because I've always, my love is Italian food. Mm -hmm. There is so much to Italian food in its simplicity to the point that you don't understand how they can achieve those flavors with just five ingredients. Yeah. Mm? Yeah. So I would, I would go lunch in Italy. We have three favorite places. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. it's called um, Scarabeo. Okay. It is a small restaurant tucked within a lemon grove. 
on the island of Prashada. Oh. And Prashada is probably 30 minutes from Naples. So you have, the, there's only boat access again. Yeah. So that would be one. That's always been one of my favorite restaurants. Mm-hmm. Recently, we discovered another random restaurant um, on the hill uh, of Tuscany, which we love. Um, and third one is our friend's restaurant in Genoa, where my girls were born. Mm-hmm. And there we had the best comfort foods. So Italy is very spread out. It depends on where I want to go yeah, for lunch. Yeah, because Italy is very it's, special. It's so yeah. special. I would move there tomorrow. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> I'll join you. <laughs> yeah. And then dinner would be Japan. Okay, so what would you want like a nice steak or would you want like a ramen, a simple food or sushi? Everything. So Everything. I eat a lot. Yeah. So for me, a cuisine is it's not just about one bowl of something. Mm-hmm. Um, it has to be many different things together. Many different things. And I, I would love... I love some, that. Uh, I love that. That's so amazing to have the <laughs> option, right? Because yeah. you don't know what you're in the mood for. A hundred percent. So then coming back to Dubai, and yes. of course, you represent the top chefs here yeah. in the region. Yeah. And who better than you to tell us where would be the perfect place for you to have breakfast, lunch and dinner in Dubai or the UAE? Breakfast, that the standout breakfast so far would be the Royal Atlantis uh, mm-hmm. gastronomy because of the range that you have. Mm-hmm. However, a more down to earth um, breakfast would be 21 grams, mm. um, the Balkan breakfast. Yeah. And that's where I would go hang out with friends, have a coffee. Uh, for lunch, Bait Mariam. For Middle Eastern. Oh. And a quick Italian. Probably a lychee, blue mm-hmm. waters. So it's actually not a fair question for someone like me. Sure, yeah. Because I would easily, I can think of the top 24. But yeah, and then dinner, depending on the cuisine. Mm-hmm. If it's a special event out, we have Oceano, we have got Trezin Studio. We have got Ofali Brothers. There's you know? a lot, yeah. We, that's, we're really everyone. spoiled for choice over here. We are really, yeah, really, absolutely. really spoiled. But, you know, um, because because you're so much into food and yeah. you love good food and you understand ingredients mm-hmm. and everything, which do you think is kind of your favorite country to go on a culinary journey? Again, there can be many because you can experience different. But what is special as, you know, if you want to have a culinary culinary journey uh, and you go specifically for food uh, which country would be special for you i grew up in singapore and there is no other country that has a my rate of cuisines in one country Mm -hmm. so you have malay chinese indian eurasian as the base um national dishes right and then we have the street foods. So you can have a culinary journey just on hawker food itself yeah. and you can't finish yeah. trying out every single dish three three meals a day over 365 That's days amazing. a year. So Singapore, you would say, would be a fantastic culinary, culinary journey. Culinary yeah. destination. For sure. Singapore would be perfect. Singapore. Yeah, and slowly Dubai is getting there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Which is Which is the beauty of the yes. place also. So now, Jean, what, what is next on your travel bucket list? So for me, on my to-do list is the Galapagos Islands Mm -hmm. and South South America. Also. Mm. That's where I've not explored. Yeah, you're doing it slowly and I'm sure it'll be a great experience. I mean, um, I have been to a few countries in South America. Brazil is Mm -hmm. very special Mm -hmm. to me and I'm sure you will enjoy Mm -hmm. it. I'm sure you will do it very soon as well. And when you go to Argentina, you must go to the Mendoza region. I am sure. Yeah, which will be beautiful. I'm sure you'll have an incredible time and you'll come back with so many more experiences and stories. This was so lovely. Thank you so much. We've come to the end of the podcast. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Keep doing the incredible work that you do. So thank you so much for joining us on this podcast, sharing your travel stories. So inspiring and so encouraging for people out there to go visit those various places and also do the awesome stuff that you are doing. Thank Thank you, you. Jean. Thank you for having me. 
Thank you everyone for tuning in today. I hope our conversations have fueled your wanderlust and inspired you to explore the world in new and exciting ways. Please don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and do leave us a comment below and let us know what you thought of today's episode. Until the next time, safe travels and keep exploring. Thank you.